Hi, I'm Diana Gordon, Education and Outreach Coordinator at the Oregon National Primate Research Center. Over 3,000 people visit our center each year, mostly from the state of Oregon, but also from other states and even other countries as well. For those of you who are unable to visit us in person, we hope that this video will provide you with a good overview of the role our center plays in the search for preventions, cures, and improved treatments for people and animals. Our center is one of eight national centers where scientists conduct basic biomedical research to further our understanding of the human body and how it works, how to keep us healthy, and how to treat people and animals who develop medical conditions. The eight national primate research centers provide support for scientists who are interested in human and animal health and disease. At the Oregon National Primate Research Center, scientists study health problems such as depression, obesity, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, infertility, pregnancy disorders, aging, and infectious disease, including AIDS. Scientists at the center make use of the latest technologies, including cell and tissue culture, as well as animal models. Primate centers provide healthy, non-human primate models of human disease for scientists who require them for their work. The Primate Center has three research divisions. The Division of Neuroscience, the Division of Reproductive Science, and the Division of Pathobiology and Immunology. Later, we will talk with scientists from each of these divisions to learn more about their important work. But first, let's meet Dr. Nancy Hagwood, the director of the Oregon National Primate Research Center. The uh, Oregon National Primate Research Center is one of the eight national primate centers that is funded by the National Institutes of Health. And our mission is, as a group and as individual centers, to provide animal models that can improve human health by serving as models for human disease. My lab has been working on HIV research and vaccines primarily for more than the last 25 years. We've been actively pursuing ways to understand how the human immune response and the monkey immune response can control the virus. And our particular interest is also in mother-to-child transmission. In addition to the advancements already mentioned by Dr. Hagwood, Scientists at the Oregon National Primate Research Center have made many significant contributions to improve health care, including a significant advancement that will likely speed the development of gene therapies aimed at preventing inherited diseases passed from mothers to their children, advancements which allow women who become infertile due to cancer treatments to become pregnant with their own children once they become cancer-free, methods for counteracting some of the damage to unborn children caused by smoking during pregnancy, and an improved understanding of the age-related decline of the immune system, information which will be used to improve existing vaccines or the way in which we vaccinate the elderly. This latest area of research is of particular interest to scientist Dr. Ilham Masoudi Powers, a researcher in the Primate Center and the OHSU Vaccine and Gene Therapy Institute. We recently caught up with Dr. Masoudi Powers in her lab to talk about her research and the ways in which it will benefit all of us. So what my laboratory is interested in is looking at how the immune system changes with age. We're projecting that by 2020, 30% of the U.S. population will be over the age of 55. They are also more susceptible to infectious diseases than younger individuals. And so what my laboratory is interested in is um, to gain a better understanding of what are the changes that occur in the immune system with age, what contributes to these changes, what is the impact of these changes on specific viruses or bacteria that we may encounter, and what can we do to prevent them, reverse them, uh, or improve vaccine responses or the immune responses to infection in our older population so that we can protect them and we can improve their quality of life. One of the viruses that we're really interested in is called varicella zoster virus. Um, and this virus causes chicken pox in children, which is a benign childhood disease that we don't see very much nowadays because we have a vaccine against it. However, those of us who've had chicken pox in the past are susceptible to something that you may know as shingles. And what shingles is, is this virus awakening. So after chicken pox, the virus goes into hiding into, in our nervous system. And when we get older and our immune system weakens, this virus can reawaken and cause a new disease that we call shingles. Um, we cannot study this virus outside the body. 
And furthermore, um, this virus does not cause any disease in any other species but humans. So we have to develop an animal model so that we can understand better how this virus hides, how, what does it need to hide, what are the immune deficiencies that occur that enable it to come out of its hiding in order for us to be able to counteract it with a vaccine. And the only way for us to come up with a new vaccine is to have an animal model so that we can test uh, new therapeutics, test new vaccines, identify what is important from the immune system perspective to keep this virus under check for our entire lifespan. Uh, we cannot do that in the absence of an animal model. We cannot recapitulate these things in a petri dish or in a tissue culture dish or in a computer. The immune response is so complex that you absolutely have to study it in the middle of, in the host, in an animal model. Another highly regarded researcher within the Primate Center and the Vaccine and Gene Therapy Institute is Dr. Mark Slifka. His specific interest is creating improved vaccines to protect us from infectious disease. Uh, so our, our primary focus in my lab is learning how the immune system works and how to develop better vaccines to protect against infectious diseases. And you're right, the work that we do is a combination of both human clinical studies as well as uh, animal work. And this is a nice combination uh, of experiments because we can look at certain aspects under the human condition, but to do experiments and to learn about the mechanisms underlying strong immune responses or weaker immune responses, we can answer those questions in our animal models. And what sorts of diseases are you studying at this time? Uh, we're studying a wide variety of, of, of infectious diseases. We've been studying smallpox and monkeypox infections and, and their role in biodefense research. But we're now we've also focused more on flaviviruses. There's viruses like West Nile virus, uh, which is important here in the U.S., or yellow fever, which is important if you travel to these endemic countries. And in another lab, researcher Larry Sherman is working to develop new treatments for brain injuries. So the lab is really focused on understanding how the brain repairs itself or doesn't repair itself in different conditions. And we're looking in three different areas. Uh, in, you mentioned multiple sclerosis. That's one of the key areas of the lab. We're really trying to understand how we can repair the brain in patients who have had attacks of multiple sclerosis, have a lot of impairment. How can we get the brain to repair itself? That's one of the key focuses of the lab. Another area that we're really interested in is understanding aging, the normal aging process. How is it that the brain changes with age, and why is it that older brains have a harder time repairing themselves than younger brains? Dr. Sherman and his colleagues are hoping to repair brain injury through the use of stem cells or pharmaceuticals. We're testing this in a couple different models, one of which is a mouse model of multiple sclerosis. And this is a model where we actually have to induce the disease in the mouse and then try to reverse the process using these drugs. The other is in a spontaneous model of multiple sclerosis, which has been characterized here at the center, at the primate center. Um, and this is in our Japanese macaque colony. We feel that if we can cure these monkeys of this disease, or at least reverse the damage process, we'd have a very good chance of reversing the process in humans. Another scientist in the center's neuroscience division, Kevin Grove, is also interested in brain injury, specifically how exposure to a high-fat diet during gestation may act on the developing brain to result in obesity later in life. We know that there's an increase in childhood obesity. We know that there's an increase in cardiovascular disease in children, and we know that there's an increase in diabetes in, in children and fatty liver disease for that matter of fact. The, most of that, the focus of those diseases in children has been attributed to uh, you know, lack of exercise or increased c density in diets at school or the lack of uh, physical education at school for example. But this work on the non-human primates has really pointed to the fact that the early development, the pregnancy state predisposes the offspring and so now clinicians are going back and looking in the early infant period and finding that there's increased fatty liver disease in young infants prior to the school age. A third group of scientists comprise the Center's Division of Reproductive Sciences. These researchers are investigating new and safer methods of birth control. They are also trying to help men and women who are experiencing fertility issues. My research involves preserving fertility in female cancer survivors. So it's been estimated about one in 50 women between the ages of birth and about 40, which includes the reproductive years, will be diagnosed with cancer in the United States. And the National Cancer Institute has designated 
fertility preservation as their number one quality of life issue for cancer survivors. So the fact that most of these, or many of these cancer patients are surviving now, they are dealing with the issue of infertility because the chemotherapy and the radiation therapy that they undergo, and it again depends on the kind of treatment they receive, can cause the patients, both male and female, to be infertile. We could not do this research without monkeys. Monkeys, reproductive system, particularly the rhesus that we use here, is identical to that of women. And they are the ideal animal model to use for any kind of fertility, infertility, contraceptive research. My lab focuses primarily on understanding the basic cellular and molecular processes that occur within the ovary with the ultimate goal of trying to identify targets that will be suitable for the development of novel contraceptive um, agents. My hope is that, that this research, our research, will lead to a very safe and effective contraceptive agent that can be widely applied uh, to meet the challenges of, of um, you know, significant global population growth. In addition to hearing from our many scientists, we also invite visitors to view our animals, living in their uniquely constructed habitats built to encourage animal behaviors that are found in the wild. For example, the enclosures that you are looking at right now are what we call outdoor sheltered housing. These areas feature three separate living areas for the animals. Each room contains place structures and a variety of locations for animals to perch. In the wintertime, the floors are heated and misters cool the animals on hot summer days. In addition, swimming pools may be brought in during the summer so that the animals can swim. In the springtime, you will often spot newborns in close contact with their mothers in these housing areas. The next stop on our video tour is the Japanese macaque corral. The ancestors of these animals came to the primate center in 1965 as a gift from the Japanese government. They are often referred to as snow monkeys because they are adapted for life in cold weather climates and enjoy playing in the occasional snow we receive here at the center. For the most part, these animals are involved in observational studies, meaning that researchers gain their data by observing the animals from an observation tower that overlooks this two-acre corral. You should also note that this corral is filled with play structures designed and built by animal caretakers at the Primate Center. Let's listen to the director of the Primate Center's Behavioral Services Unit, Dr. Christine Coleman, as she tells us more about these animals and the work she and her staff do to promote their psychological well-being. This group was the subject of a lot of groundbreaking behavioral work in the 1970s and 80s, and a lot of what we know about the effects of various hormones on behavior was learned from this troop. The Behavioral Services Unit is a unit that's responsible for overseeing the emotional and psychological needs of the monkeys at the center. Our main goal is to reduce stress and improve well-being for the monkeys here. And to do this, we provide the monkeys with opportunities to engage in normal behaviors, behaviors they would do in the wild. And we also give them opportunities to exercise control and choice. Animal care is around the clock, 365 day a year operation at the Oregon Primate Center. Over 100 highly trained staff, including 14 veterinarians and eight behaviorists, provide state-of-the-art care for the animals that live at the center. This important job is overseen by Dr. C.J. Doan, the head veterinarian at ONPRC. So right now we have approximately 4,000 uh, rhesus macaques and uh, a few smatterings of some cinemologous macaques and some baboons and some uh, African green monkeys. But the majority of our animals here are rhesus macaques. Our monkeys get wonderful care. So they are observed daily, at least twice, by a, our very um, well-trained animal care staff. If they have any medical issues, those medical issues are reported immediately to the veterinary staff and the, the veterinarians evaluate them. And just like you would go to see the doctor, uh, you'll, these animals get a full physical exam and, and whatever problem they may be having on that given day they'll be treated and, and medications will be prescribed and they'll be taken care of from then, then on out until their uh, case resolves. We are under both the auspices of the Animal Welfare Act and its regulations as well as the uh, Public Health Service Policy on Animal Care, uh, Lab Animal Care and its uh, according policies. And so. We, uh, we are highly regulated in terms of 
how what our veterinary care program is, what our what our occupational health care program is, what our facilities are like, um, such that these animals get the best possible habitat as well as the best possible care, and. Uh, yeah, and that's all that's all mandated, not only because it's the right thing to do, but also because it's required federally. It's the best part is that, you know, our our job, our entire staff, the whole 110 people, the job is to take care of the animals and it's to care for the animals and that's what we do. We we come in every day, we care for them, we be, we become very bonded to them and we make sure that they're cared for humanely. Dr. Doan's staff shares her enthusiasm in their work with animals. We we love what we do and we try to do the best that we can and make sure that the monkeys are as comfortable as possible. Take the best care of them as we can. We try to provide them with fun enrichment or yummy treats every day. We try to interact with them every day. Uh, and that we do um, care deeply and that it's a pretty good life for the primates here. I'm happy that you could join us for a tour of the Primate Center. If you would like more information about how to join a public tour, please visit the web address on your screen. There you can find information about individual research projects here at the center, more information about animal care, and also about outreach programs. Thank you very much.